I'll follow your lead. You're the you're you're, 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 you're you're the host. You know what you're doing. I don't. Good morning, everybody. We're live, and here's the title of our conversation: Is education upside down? And it was all Nick's idea. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. You're welcome. And um, what's this all about? Why are we here today? Um, I guess because I've been interested in, the, you know, I'm not a, uh, I've never been a, a formal teacher. Uh, I'm a, I was a scientist originally, and I've been a sort of facilitator of learning, a coach, a counsellor, a consultant, a trainer, a developer for many, many years. Um, and I've been interested in uh, learning for a, for a long time. And uh, ages ago, uh, I was just sort of thinking, really, of, about little little children uh, and why it is that they learn so fast. Um, and I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, maybe it's because the conditions around uh, little children uh, when they're really learning uh, quickly, you know, is that uh, they're very different from what happens in schools. Because in, at home, when, uh, you know, if, if it, let's assume a child is, uh, you know, is well loved and they're learning to walk, they're not told how to do it. They're not told when to do it. They're not even told they ought to do it. They do it because they want to. And the, the the parents around them just get give them noisy approval all the time. <laughs> and if they uh, if they if they fall if they sit down and don't quite make it, they don't tell them off and say they're not doing it right. They just give them pour on love and approval. And lo and behold, um, the child walks and everybody is happy. The child's happy and the parents are happy. Uh, and then three minutes later, the child is running around and the mum and dad are chasing after them and thinking, maybe this isn't a great idea after all. But nonetheless, it, it, the process is extremely enjoyable. So if that happens naturally, uh, why is it that sort of half ch half the children in secondary schools get uh, put off learning permanently and don't actually mm. enjoy it and don't want to learn? I think that's crazy. Um, so I just thought about it and I've done some investigation and I've come across some examples where uh, it seems to me there are models of education which are much more in tune with the natural way in which children learn than what, we're, what we do at the moment, which is where uh, what we, what's actually happening in schools is uh, people are being trained to conform, to be cloned, into being, uh, uh, yes, into conform, into to being consumers, into getting, quotes, good jobs, um, which is another topic altogether. Um, so, yeah, I'm a bit of a radical, really. Uh, <laughs> that'll do, that'll, that's more than enough for an introduction. Well... <laughs> Yeah, training, uh, being trained to not think mm. and learn. And so I'm a, a mum of teens and I've been an educator for the past 25 years. And again, a bit of a, a kind of a, not a square peg because I feel what I do is really important that, that the creativity and play is very eroded and has been more and more. Um, so I stepped for a number of years and and I often feel that coupled with that decline how we've also seen the increase in children's mental health problems um, and then we bring in well-being into schools and we talk more about well-being but really if we were allowed them to be more they would be well and um, by as, as we're both facilitators and are passionate about actually I think provide, creating spaces for people to flourish, for people to work out stuff for themselves. Um, if we did that more with children and allowed that, then we wouldn't have this this mental health um, increase. And we'd see less uh, children, so, you know, more children would be engaged with their learning. And I think you said about secondary children. I think it happens quite early on mm. in primary schools with children feeling that way too now. 
and and I think the fun's gone a lot of the fun has gone out of education particularly where's the fun you know mm. so that's I guess why we've <clears throat> joined together and um I feel I think we're on a we're on a same similar pathway Hmm. It's mission. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I mean, I agree that, um, you know, if you think again about young people and how they learn, um, you know, and it, I mean, we are animals. And if you, you know, I mean, children, animals and young, you know, learn by play, by doing things. They, they, they don't learn passively by being sitting sitting down. You know, my father was a very very successful uh, primary school teacher, and he he had two. I remember two things that he said. The first thing was the natural state of children is to run around and chat. Um, so, uh, you know, the first thing that happens to uh, to very young children is they're supposed to sit down and be quiet and be passive, mm -hmm. which is yeah. not the natural state uh, of, uh, of of children at all. That isn't the way uh, in which um, in in which they learn most effectively. And the other thing he said was um, when I asked him what's his secret, because he was very successful, and we've got evidence from that from letters that were written by children he taught many years ago, which we I actually got a few weeks before he died at ninety. So these were some letters which he'd written by John. He, he, he taught 50 years earlier, um, which was, you know, love children and make the lessons interesting. Mm. But the important, the important thing is is lo loving, ch loving children. And, you know, I think every child is different. Um, now I'd, I'd really would like to talk to you a bit about a school which does it differently. Yeah. Um, and people will say the listeners to this will say, "Oh, that couldn't possibly work, doesn't couldn't possibly work, and it wouldn't work in the UK for a seven million different reasons." But the fact is, it, it, it is a school where it where it, it does work and has worked for, for since about you know, the sixties. Um, it's a school called Sudbury Valley uh, School. There are. Um, uh, there are several schools around, many schools around the world, not many, there are certainly several schools around the world that use the same model. And if the um, uh, readers, uh, listeners to this want to find out more, the website is just a very simple website. The address is just sudval.org. But uh, Sudbury Valley School uh, has, uh, interestingly, it has no curriculum and no exams. And uh, it only has classes if the children ask for them. Uh, a lot of the learning takes place in, uh, in um, uh, mix, mil between people of different, children of different ages. And it isn't always a 16 year old learning from a six year old, it's sometimes a six year old. Uh, uh, Sorry, it isn't always a six-year-old learning from a 16-year-old. It's sometimes the other way around because sometimes mm -hmm. six-year-olds are actually better at doing things than 16-year-olds are. And there's some lovely um, things that when you go on the website and look at the uh, and look at the DVDs of the things they uh, describing the things they uh, they actually do. Um, they just let me give you just uh, give you just a, a couple of examples. One is in the grounds of this um, uh, of the school. There's some um, there's some boulders, some some uh, boulders, and the uh, you can see that the ch the children uh, when they have a free choice about which route to climb up these boulders because they obviously they do it because they want to. They don't choose the make the easiest routes. Mm. They actually choose the most challenging routes because they want because they have an innate you know when their children are free they have an innate um, drive to learn. There's another thing that uh, a story is very interesting, which is one of the uh, adults because there are some adults who are sort of more 
yeah, innate facilitators and supporters, I suppose, than conventional teachers. Who's seeing a little girl called Rose, I think it was, Rosie. Uh, and Rosie is making letters like calligraphy, you know, on her, she's quite young. And the teacher says, well, that's interesting, Rosie. He says, why, I understand that you, I know you love writing, but I don't understand why you, why you do it, because I don't, I don't think you can read. She said, no, no, I can't. And she said, well, why do you do it? Uh, because it's pretty. <laughs> um, the, they found that um, some children will choose to read at four. And some children won't get, won't choose to that want to learn to read until they're eleven or twelve. Mm -hmm. No child is ever told you ought to learn to read. When the child wants to read, they'll learn to read in three months, and they'll read anything. Oh. For they all want to eventually. They all want to eventually because they see their peers at the school enjoying it, mm -hmm. and they, they want to join in. Gosh, and we're pushing it so early on, aren't we? This whole should be doing, should, 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 and the panic and the targets and the, you know, going onto this band, that band, and, yeah. and that's where they, yeah, yeah, that's it. And then it and it loses that love of. Yeah, children, so children, that, children learn when they children are all different. I mm. mean, they, I mean, the last time when I, when I last sort of uh, looked at the uh, the information about it. They had, in the last 50, they've not had a single case of dyslexia, not one. Because maybe, and you know, maybe dyslexia is, is caused when children are actually forced to, to, to read when they're not, actually, they're not mm. actually ready. Not one. Mm. Um, so it can be done. Um, the other thing that's really interesting at the school is it actually, it's a democracy. So decisions are made on the basis of one person, one vote, and that includes the children. Um, and they, they, they police their own um, behaviour, like there's an agreement in the school that basically you, what, you can't do things which get in the way of other people learning, which, they, they, which actually the whole school agrees to. Mm. But then the, uh, the, 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 the disciplinary system is actually run by the children. Somebody can bring somebody up for misbehaviour and then it's investigated. So how many of these schools, is it one? Is it, are they got, is it like no, a... There, there is, there are the, I don't actually know how many of these schools there are across the world, but there's certainly more than one. Uh, there are, I don't know, there are some in, in Europe. Uh, there's certainly one in, there's one in Israel. Um, uh, yeah, there's one in there's there's one in Berlin, in in Holland, somewhere in France, I believe. I, I actually don't know. Okay. But it but it's if you want to, um, there's a superb book called yeah. Free at Last, which you can get from the website, or you could probably get from the library. I don't know. Um, is that by? Is it just by? It's by it's by Daniel Greenberg, who's the um, the founder of the school. Daniel Green is it B U R G? No, but B E R G. B E R G. Daniel Greenberg. I just put that up in the. Um, yes, Daniel Greenberg. Put it in the banner. <laughs> yes, there. Daniel. Free at last by Daniel Greenberg, uh, and he he's um, this. Uh, there's been a longitudinal study as well of the the sort of jobs that people go into and the things that people say about the school and the way the school has has helped them, because. Obviously, if every day you go to the school and you have to decide what you want to do, um, uh, then, you know, people actually get to um, learn how to be lifelong learners. They learn how to be autonomous. They learn how to take responsibility. Um, mm -hmm. And they have, a, they have a whole experience of that. So when they come out, they're really very resourceful people. 80% um, of the... Uh, young people who come out of the of this universe of this um, of school decide to go to college, and they nearly all go to the college of their first choice, without any qualifications. Because suppose a child has been really interested in art, 
that's been their passion. They might have spent four hours a day for the last 10, 15 years developing their, their abilities. Um, they're going to be pretty good at it at the end. Yeah. So, yeah. My, I had a question about, um, you know, technology, obviously mm-hmm. playing such a big part in our children's lives. And it's all very well saying, oh, we need them to play more and have fun. But, you know, when I speak to parents, most mums I work with, it's, 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 it's finding um, boundaries around technology use. Do you think at that school they're allowed to you go on it whenever they want? So that, you know, is there a, yes. you know, they're yes. just allowed on it? Yes. Um, mm. And, um, and uh, they said, you know, if you really engage in something, you will, learn. you, you will, you will learn. Mm. Um, Mm. Yes, they do. Yes, they. they okay. yeah, yeah, yes, they do. I mean, the there are there are very few ag- agreed sort of rules. One is uh, one is something about um, oh, going on the lake in the winter or something like that. I mean, I think that's one of the one of the rules. And I, I obviously don't know all the details. I mean, I haven't visited. No, we get to research but, a bit more, won't it? Yeah, I haven't yeah. actually visited the school, but I mean, there is a regular blog. And, okay. and this is only one of the the um, radical alternatives to uh, yeah. the, the conventional top-down approach to education. Um, there are others which are also think you think oh, that, that's not possible, but it is. And what, what? Why do you think you think differently like this about it all? Where did this come from for you? For me. Mm. Um, well, actually, I mean, I learned about this school quite. Uh, quite by accident I was working with a, uh, a client a guy called Chris Rimmer who um, I remember he was sitting in the room at the back and he said by the way um, I, uh, you might have heard about Sudbury Valley School and there's a book which I really recommend and I I bought this book oh, 20 years ago 15 years ago probably and I uh, read it and it turned everything I'd ever thought about education completely on its head Mm. Like you think this mm-hmm. isn't possible, uh, but it actually is. Um, yeah, and it's about trust. You know, uh, we adults think we know best all the time when it comes around children. Children are much cleverer than we are. Um, there's a um, a friend of ours, a family friend who worked for Unilever, and he had a colleague. Um, and his colleague was moved around by Unilever in, for about five five years. He was moved uh, through, I think, five or six countries because that was the way Unilever worked. And he had a young child, and he decided to put his child into the into local kindergartens uh, where they were speaking, rather than sending them into international school where he would only be taught in English. Mm-hmm. This child, by the time he was six, was fluent in five in five languages. Amazing. He would pick up a language in uh, yeah, and be fluent in a couple of months uh, in, in a new school. That, that's the sort of capability that young people have. We I mean, we're not as 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 a species, but we're not. Uh, we haven't got the biggest teeth. You know, we're not. We're not. We're not strong. We're not the fastest animals. Um, we're not we haven't got the biggest teeth uh, you know um, uh, but we are we have minds and we're professional the only one thing that a baby is professional at is learning Mm. earlier on we spoke a little bit about um you you'd been doing some research into the words the, the roots of education yes yes Yes, there's um, there are two words which, and they, they they actually reflect the the conflict I think that there is at the heart of the way we think about it. There's educare, and educare um, central meaning seems to me it's something like to train, which is saying that you know the job of education is to train uh, young people in the uh, to behave and in the the skills they they need 
you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, and so on. The in in sort of so it's about training. And I'm not saying there's anything you know that we don't need. People obviously do need those things. But edu the other route is educare with a with an ere, and the um, uh, that means to um, bring out. So that's about helping, uh, encouraging things like uh, uh, curiosity, um, investigation, flexibility. And if you think about very young children, very young children, their basic human qualities, they're the sort of qualities we actually need at the moment because the world is changing so fast. So we need rapid learning. Um, uh, I've, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm doing a job which didn't, which I didn't, uh, sorry, many of us are doing jobs which didn't exist 20 years ago. So there's no point in training people to do the, only to do the jobs that exist now, because in 20 years time, most of them won't, many of them won't exist. Mm. But what we can do is help people learn. And, and that's what educare is about, help, helping and encouraging people to, to learn rapidly. And for that, I think that we just need to get out of the way. Mm. You know, give young folks love, support, encouragement, and help them learn and get out of the way. Because we don't know, we can't predict what the jobs are going to be in 20 years' time or 30 years' time when they're at school, when, when they come out of in, in, uh, school into full-time work. There's no way. We don't know. Let's face it, the internet didn't exist in, in, in 25 years ago. And it's changed everything. And that's, that's not a very long time. So when we decided to have this conversation, is education upside down? It was, uh, yeah, we were kind of, well, let's just do it and let's uh, record it and then see where it goes. So if you are watching or you watch after, I think we've got a couple of people tuning in. Um, you know, we'd love to hear from you too. And maybe you'd like to come and join us in the conversation sometime in the future as well. Um. I certainly feel as a teacher that I was very focused on following everything for quite a while. I didn't go in straight into education and into teaching. I did quite a, other, quite a lot of things beforehand, travel and work, you know, different jobs. And it wasn't until I went to teach in Tanzania for a couple of years. I taught at a main, you know, an international school. But I was very close to the head teacher at another school, an IB school. And there were a few and I'd never even heard of the IB system, hmm. uh, which was more project-based way of yeah. learning. And one of the teachers I taught with, um, she was trained in it and her thinking was very different to my thinking. And it took me a while to shift hmm. from what I knew to and everything I knew to actually there's a different way. There's a different way of teaching. It's not all, you know, here we are, here's a differentiated worksheet, here's the PowerPoint, and let's all do, and then here's a little question at the end, perhaps if you want to do a bit further thinking. Oh, we've run out of time, we can't do that further thinking. So it definitely made the way I teach very different. So now and then when I came back into the UK, it was harder then to to fit back in even more so <laughs> into the education system so that's hence one of the reasons I sort of created this and created the resilient you know called it resilient kids as a way to give children a vision vitality and voice and again just to I feel just yeah just even today be a voice for them you know to um and connect with others who felt as passionately about that as myself and I know yourself so yes if you're watching and you feel aligned with what we're saying or not you know we'd love to to hear from you and we'll put on another one of these i'm sure in the future we have got a comment let's see what that what, uh, mike oh mike's here hi mike i have read ref etymology of education that the duc the duck bit is related to the duke leader and is about self-leadership ah mm. thanks mike i didn't know that 
No. Thank you for being here. <laughs> yeah. And that's funny, isn't it, that you know each other and we knew each other separately. I find that funny. <laughs> I, know, I, I know Mike very well. We spend, yeah. uh, we spend regular, but we we call it nagging. Uh, we we have a, we have a nag once a Do you? once a month. Yeah, it's basically we spend about twenty minutes each of us talking about whatever's on our mind, and the other one listens and helps and challenges and provokes. And uh, uh, yeah, it's been great fun. We've been doing it for a, must be a couple of years now. It's it's really good. So, what would you call that? Educate edu. Uh, I, 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 a bit of both, I think, but I think it's probably mostly uh, ure, which is uh, you know uh, bring, bringing out, really. Mm. Yeah, I I I, I, I realised I've just left something out, left some an, another model out, which is yes. I think the readers may be really interested in. Um, this is um, uh, a. a Guy called Sugata Mitra, uh, Suga, S U G A T A Mitra, M I T R A, and he he's done a, a few uh, te TED talks. Um, one is called something like the Hole in the Wall, and the other one is called um, the School in the Cloud. Now, just to summarise very briefly, oh, yes. he. Um, he he lived in India, and he I think it was in De either Delhi or Mumbai. I can't one of the big cities anyway. And he made an, an experiment, which is he put in the wall of the office building a sort of an armored uh, computer with a, a trackball uh, and obviously and a webcam somewhere to observe it. And this thing, this this office block was surrounded with a, a slum, and he just left it there. It's going to the internet. And very quickly, there were two little children there, and it looked like it was something like a, an, an eight-year-old and a six-year-old, and the eight-year-old was teaching the six-year-old how to browse. So they were actually really interested in, um, you know, in, in they could learn how to browse the computer with no, with no um, instruction whatsoever. Uh, so I thought, well, that's really interesting. Children can clearly access the internet and find things out for themselves so he actually uh, he actually pushed this um and the the thing he did was i think was absolutely amazing he he, he put a similar computer into an area of india uh, where people spoke very accented english but the computer was um arranged that it would own that it it would only you could you know you could communicate it with speech so when they spoke to it in this very accented english it would just it would just call gobbledygook children very quickly learned how to speak to it so it would actually speak um uh, reg to, to speak regular english so so it would actually understand them and this computer um the thing it would connect and tell them about was actually about microbiology so it was quite. It was a really technical thing. These kids were sitting around this around this uh, thing, and he thought, well, you know, they're not going to learn anything. So he he actually went and sort of tested these these kids. And yes, if they'd taken a standard exam on this subject, they would probably have failed. Um, and uh, and he he asked them and said to them, uh, well. Uh, yeah, what have you learned? And he said, well, nothing. Um, what you, nothing. He said, yeah, we, we actually don't understand um, how RNA helps replication or something like that. And then the other thing that was really interesting was that he, he actually recruited what he called some grannies. Mm. And the grannies were people who didn't know anything about it, but they would stand around the children and they would say, gosh, how do you do that? How very clever. Oh gosh, you are clever, aren't you? And just sort of pour on sort of love and support to these children. And they were actually completely self-motivated. There was no reward for the children. They were just engaging this for fun. When they had the grannies, they did at least as well as they would have done if they'd been if they'd been if they'd been studying the same subject at formal school with formal education. 
Yeah. The, the reason for doing this be, was because, as in most countries, you can't get teachers to go into. It's very difficult to get good teachers to go into highly deprived areas because they're not comfortable places to be. So, that, and there aren't enough teachers in India to teach all the children that need to be taught. But by using this mechanism, the children could actually learn anything. And this has been replicated. You do, one person, one one child, one computer doesn't work very well. But if you have four child, four yeah. children, four children on one computer, so they can actually interact with the material and talk to each other, uh, then you get great learning. And it's something we've modelled. We tried in Tanzania as well. So Julie uh, set that up. We had a staff meeting about it. Yeah, right. And because a lot of children, a lot of ways tech is taught is you go into a computer room and you'll have one child on one computer yeah. and that's your tech lesson. Whereas actually, if you integrate technology into your day, and I have to say, I go into schools and it's just not, we just, I don't see it. It's still often a standalone lesson that you might put it into the computer. So, uh, you know, when I've got kind of opportunities, there's one school I work in that I am allowed to do things like this. And I and I work with someone for like mindedness. And, um, you know, if I get the tablets out, the computers out and yeah, I have four children to it. And there's so there is so much collaboration with it. And it's not what you think it's going to be. be mm. and, and, and then people say, oh, I haven't got enough computers. Actually, you don't need a whole set of computers in a classroom. No. You don't need every child to have one. You can just have three or four, and then they can just go to as they would go to a dictionary and encyclopedia. It's just there for them when they want. But because we're not teaching in a way that it's very, you know, as I said earlier, PowerPoint led, worksheet led, that, that, that we're not teaching research skills necessarily. There might be one research lesson every now and then, but actually, every, if every every module, every topic, or every not even a topic, if you're working more in a child centered, child led way, every interest the technology is there to facilitate that and you are there as an adult to guide them when necessary when it's when you know so yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a brilliant model yeah well he's, he's now based at the university of um newcastle i think or get yes mm. certainly in, in the north oh. of, in the north of Should england we, maybe we could invite him to speak on the show <laughs> maybe we could yes i mean he's i mean why not? I, yeah why not indeed i mean the other thing i think that again really fascinates me uh jane and i haven't done anything with this apart from have the idea is that uh, very young children ask great questions. So I, I think what would happen if you had uh, some of these questions that children are investigating actually asked, asked, either asked by by these children these great questions, or even have adults being challenged by the great questions that children ask. Yeah, a friend. A, so you probably had some great questions. I've got a little book that I've published very suddenly, like two or three pages. It's called The Wisdom of Children. Yeah, well done. And it's exactly that. It's the children's questions. Yeah, it's called The Wisdom of Children. I just put it onto one of my yeah. places, that landing places somewhere. <laughs> well, I think it would be fun. But how can we, yeah. It would be great fun to invite. And the idea was how can we encourage, oh, sorry, it's the lag. Sorry. Yeah, carry on. I'm, I'm getting excited, which is why I'm interrupting. Keep no, going. go on, there's a lag. <laughs> No, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. It was more like how to encourage how to encourage adults to be pl more playful and creative was the kind of yeah. headline for them, and that's what they came up with. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking. Well, what would happen if you actually put those had some forum where you could put those childlike que questions to a group of adults mm. and have them have a playful discussion about it? I mean, um, a, a question that uh, a young uh, I think the niece of, a, of an acquaintance. Of, well, she used to be uh, the, the HR director in a company I work with. Uh, Nina, her niece, uh, came to her and said to her one day, this is the niece I think was about seven or eight, and I looked her in the eye and said, Auntie, what are people for? <laughs> that is a good question. Are people for four? Now let's. I'll even uh, make. I'll even make. <laughs> put on the banner. <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking you've got we've got Mike here, we've got Phil, yourself, and myself. So maybe that's just it. We could have a follow up, for and anyone else who fancies it, a follow up um, play. You know, uh, we could do a little Zoom and have some of those questions. 
and see where it goes. Have a half an hour session. Edu caring. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, how, how's this gone, Jane? I mean, I, I have no idea. I know idea. Mm. <laughs> Let's just see. I think it's good to put the energy out there when we've got, uh, you know, feeling both of us and others feeling frustrated, I think, with this, with what's going on right now. So, yeah, let's just uh, publish this. We've had the conversation and there's lots still to talk about, but let's perhaps end it there today okay. and, and see where it goes. And thank you if you've watched and um, yeah, thanks for being here. Yep. Until yeah, next I, it, time. Yeah, it's, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And also, I guess, Nick, you know, if other people, you know, I know there's other people out there, you know, talking podcasting, um, radio shows, you know, maybe it'd be a good place to look out for you to go onto those shows as well, wouldn't it? And uh, and share your share your message. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how to do that. No, I don't. I don't either, but I'm sure we'll work it out. Thank you. Well, here you go. Here's Mike. Look, he's chipping in with your, here we go. He's put your website up there, nickheap.co.uk. Mike, come do the banners next time. <laughs> Give me in the studio. <laughs> He's put it twice. Why put it twice? <laughs> Look, so good. He's done it twice. <laughs> See you later. Yeah. yeah. Should we tune out? Yeah. And Phil said, "Thank you. Thank you for being here, Phil. Thank you for watching." Thank you. I will end broadcast. <laughs>